Hello, everybody. Thanks, Mark. It's a mic on. Wicked. Okay. Welcome, everybody, to the... There we go. That works better. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the final session of Industry Week. Hopefully, you guys have all enjoyed it. Has everybody enjoyed themselves? Yeah, I get a bit of a panto vibe going on, which is good. Um, so, for the last session today, you guys are really lucky uh, to have Matthew Benjamin, as you can see on the stage. Um, but otherwise known as Bushwhacker, who's had a kind of, well, huge career spanning over 30 years, touring as a DJ, uh, producing, chart hits, um, and has now just set up a company um, looking at mental well-being, which some of you guys went to the lecture to before. Wicked. So, Matthew, thanks for joining us. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, you're welcome. Um, so, um, it's been a a lengthy career, obviously. Should we start back at the beginning and kind of look at what originally inspired you to get into music? The very beginning? <laughs> well, depends. I mean, we've only got an hour and 30 minutes, so... Sure, sure. Um, hi, everyone. I, I love these lights in my eyes because I can't see you, which may, means I think that the room's full, which is brilliant. <clears throat> um, yeah, I actually, uh, my, my musical inspiration started very, very young. When I was three, um, I used to, my mum played the piano and she had a, we had a piano in our house while I was growing up and I used to, I used to sit at, uh, at the piano and I'd be, but when I could barely kind of walk and talk and, you know, start making up tracks and, or tracks, tunes and, you know, it, it was the one happy place that I really had when I was a kid, you know, um, and, um, so my passion for music start and for, for making music started really, really young. And then I guess uh, when I was at high school, um, it developed quite quickly. I, I got singled out by the music teacher for my music lessons and I started taking piano lessons. I started taking drum lessons and I got into drumming. Um, I made a lot of noise in my parents' house for a long time and drove the neighbours mad. Um, I started off with a practice pad and then got a snare drum and then got a drum kit and I'd sit in there with my Walkman and you might not know what a Walkman is, you're too young, but it's this thing with a cassette in it and it, music comes out of it. And um, I used to sit there playing the drums, listening to the police with my um, headphones on and trying to copy Stuart Copeland's rhythms and stuff. And you know, I was madly passionate about doing this. I used to go and listen to jazz every Sunday with my parents, go to these afternoon jazz concerts and I used to sit on the floor cross-legged, just obsessed with these musicians playing together and the rhythms and the melodies, and I really loved it. <clears throat> and then when I was at, at high school, when I was, you know, in the first year of high school, I got introduced to electronic music um, in the first week of being there. I sat next to a kid in, in our first art class, and the art teacher said, oh, you know, write down what kind of music you like, and he wrote electro, so I wrote electro. I didn't even know what it was. And uh, we made friends, and I went around his house, and he was listening to his dad's records, and it was like Africa Bambata, like original 80s electro music. This is in 1983, and that was it. I was hooked. I was like, I love these sounds. They're different to anything I've heard so far. This is, this is incredible. And, you know, then I discovered that my cousin had... A sampler in his house. He had a, a uh, he had a an analog synthesizer. He had a Juno 106, and he had this um, emulator um, sampler, one of the, one of the early samplers. And you know, I went around his house, and he got the microphone and sampled my voice and played it across the keyboard. And and you know, I was reading. You know, I, I geeked out on this stuff, and I was reading Sound on Sound magazine from from age kind of 12, before I knew what a single thing meant in it, I'd read it from cover to cover and kind of still do, you know. So that was my my entry into music and electronic music. And then with the DJing, um, yeah, I, I used to sit in my, my dad's garage and I had this suitcase that opened up and the top half of it was a speaker and the bottom half of it was a record player and I'd sit in there with these electro records trying to learn to scratch, trying to figure it all out. I'd sit in my bedroom with a tape recorder and another tape player and record one thing onto the onto the other and overdub stuff and it, it was I was trying to mix all these things together, you know. Then they let me DJ at the school disco, uh, swapping the tapes. Um, and then when I was fifteen, I went to a, a non-alcoholic nightclub in the basement of a church called the Parrot and Palm, 
And the DJ was a kid that I was friends with when I was eight years old um, at, mi at middle school. And I hadn't seen him for years. And the next day I went around his house, had a go of his decks, and that was it. I was like, Mum, I need to sell the drum kit. I'll need some decks. I got into DJing, you know. So that was um, around age 16, wasn't it, when you first started DJing? I started DJing publicly um, age 16. I got into it just a little bit earlier than that. I was actually... Um, the last couple of years of high school, I was also in, in an orchestra, the London School Symphony Orchestra, playing percussion. So I'd go off on these like week-long training courses with 80, 80 or so other young people from different schools around London, and learn all these uh, classical pieces and then go and perform at places like um, the Royal Festival Hall or Kenwood or the Barbican. And, and that was an incredible time in my life and I learned a lot about music and a lot about... Um, uh, you know, dynamics and timing and, and, and you know, and, and it was, you know, it was an amazing experience. But when I started DJing publicly, I was very young. I was about 16. So do you think that time in the orchestra, like looking at rhythm and kind of, you know, your percussion background, do you think that helped you when you were DJing and you first started listening to kind of getting beats in time and figuring out what was going on? Yeah, I think so. And, and the thing with the classical training was, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of waiting, a lot of counting. And, you know, it's like if you've got this whole orchestra that are playing, uh, being conducted and playing this, this amazing, you know, piece of music, whether it's Prokofiev or whoever, and, you know, your job is to crash a pair of cymbals together at the, at the very right moment. You need to know what's going on with beats and timing, yeah. So you, you started DJing, like, public at the age of 16, but ideally you'd have put in some practice before, wouldn't you? So for these guys, like, DJing and making music, kind of how much practice practice did you put in? And you were playing on vinyl then, weren't you? Still do, actually. Um, not if I... Um, I still play vinyl mostly at home, and then if I know a gig's got um, a good setup where the decks are not going to jump and they're taken care of, then then I'll do that too. But in terms of practicing, I mean, it doesn't matter what you want to do, you need to put the hours in. You need to put the hours in and just, you know, if you're passionate about this and, you know, you want to get somewhere with it, you do it and you do it and you do it and you do it. And, you know, I, I did. I, I didn't really think of it so much, I mean, maybe in the very beginning, but so much as practicing, but more of just, just doing it, you know, just getting in the zone. Did you ever feel nervous? Obviously, you you going to at the start, but how did you kind of cope with that? I still do. Um, yeah, I still do, and it, it depends. It depends what it is. Like, you know, I can go and DJ in front of five thousand people and feel kind of okay about it on what on one evening, or I can be sitting up here now and feel really nervous. You know, uh, you know, it, it just depends. I mean. It's an interesting thing because, I, you know, I, I don't drink anymore. I haven't drunk for nearly seven years. So there's no kind of, um, you know, having a couple of drinks to relax before the gig now. So nerves can come into it. But really, I feel um, comfortable when I've settled in and got in the zone and I feel like I'm connecting with the crowd. But if there's any technical problems or if there's some sort of um, rupture or disconnect, then it can be quite nerve-wracking. So what were some of your first gigs? And like, if you had any of those issues, how would you kind of cope with them? Because the technical issues, especially when you first start playing at, you know, bars and places, it, the, t the setup tends not to be great, doesn't it? Well, in some respects, I'm quite lucky um, because I learned to mix on, on turntables, but they weren't Technics. They were belt drive decks and they were, they were made by a company called Citronic. So they were a lot baggier than a pair of Technics. You... You really had to have, uh, you know, an incredible amount of control to be able to get things in time and keep them in time. And so, to go from those decks to techniques, it was, uh, it made, you know, uh, that that process a lot more seamless. But on top of that, my first regular gigs were at warehouse parties um, back in the late '80s, and the crew that I used to play for didn't use monitors in the DJ booth. So there would be these big sound systems in these massive cavernous warehouses with no monitors. So there'd be like a one second delay from what you hear in the headphones to what's actually come, you know, what's coming out of the speakers and you had to compensate for that. And so I, I trained on, I'll call them substandard decks with no monitors. So when it came to then mixing, when the conditions were good, it was like, we can do this, you know. 
was it was it hard to mix without a monitor? Because obviously, most people I know when you DJ, you know, you ideally need a monitor to listen to. How did you train yourself to listen to to that delay? Was it just practice, or you know, because ideally you're working and doing it on the sound system there and then, aren't you? It was a question of um, you know, okay, this is what you're listening to in your headphones. This is what's coming out of the speakers. This is what you're listening to that you're about to put on, and you would just switch your headphone input from the right deck to the left deck to see if they were matching up, and then you'd get used to the the echo, get used to the delay. Most people don't have to worry about that now, but you still get those gigs with no monitors, and 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 they can be a nightmare. So, what were these warehouse wa raves like back in the day? Uh, you mentioned cavernous. You know, what what kind of numbers are we talking? And were they were they legal? I mean, they went from very small to gigantic. You know, they, were, they went from, you know, 100 people to, you know, sort of, sort, of, sort of damp cave to aircraft hangars with 10, 15, 20,000 people in them, you know. Yeah, and were, were they legal at the time? Were they just illegal raves or...? Yeah, I mean, they were, they were you know, they were, they were completely illegal and the police didn't even know what was going on. I mean, they didn't try and stop them. You know, once there were people there, that was it. The, the party was on. They didn't really understand what was going on. They they just knew that there were lots of very happy-looking people in a building jumping up and down, you know, which is kind of what it's all about. I mean, this is not one of the questions we wrote down, but we'll kind of diversify a little bit. With everything that's happening in the world with price rises, do you think that kind of culture is going to come back in again where people are going to come out of clubs and kind of take it, you know, DIY, as you would say? I don't know how much of this happened already but I get the impression that it already happened in the last two years and that there were loads of illegal parties in warehouses fields whatever because of the Covid restrictions but people needed to get out and dance and you know I'm sure that those things are still going on and, 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 and will still go on yeah yeah, totally. So it has been a massive development. You see it in London a lot, don't you, under the archways and all that kind of stuff, canal boats, you know, so it's it's definitely coming back around to that, which is a good thing or a bad thing? I think people need to dance. They People need an outlet to express themselves and they need to feel a sense of freedom and they need to feel, you know, a sense of autonomy as well. And, and you know, I think that, uh, you know, whether this party is illegal or it's legal and, you know, well organised and, and put together in a way that that allows you to feel good and to enjoy yourself without feel like you're being, you know, um, scrutinised and controlled in a, in a way that um, affects your enjoyment, I think is the most important thing. Wicked. So um, you, you played a lot at the end and you were involved setting that up with Mr C, weren't you? Well, Leo, uh, the other half of Leo and Bushwhacker, uh, was uh, partners with Mr C in uh, creating, building and running the end, um, along with his sister. I was partners with Leo in Leo and Bushwhacker. And so by proxy, I was sort of in there, but I wasn't involved in the running of the club. I, I had a residency that started the day the club opened and ended the day the club shut. So, and th there was involvement, but I will not in any way take um, any credit for the amazing job that those guys did. Yeah, for anybody who doesn't know what the end is, it, what, how long did it run for? Uh, ran for about 15 years, I think, 14 years. Yeah, in London, iconic club, uh, so by Mr C. Um, but you had a residency, you said you've had many other residencies. Could you explain what a residency is and like the importance of having one, if you can get one? Uh, a residency is a regular spot, a regular gig, if you like, in the context of what we're talking about, at a regular um, space. So, uh, for example, there was a time when I, in, when I was still very young, I was 18, that I had actually four weekly residencies in London. It was... It was incredible. It would be Friday night at a club called Busby's, Saturday night at a club called The Park in Kensington High Street, then after that at the Astoria in Charing Cross Road, Sunday morning at Busby's, and then Sunday night at the Limelight every week. And that was just the residencies. Um, as time went on, those fizzled out, and then other things came along, and weekly residencies became a lot less common. Monthly residencies became more common. And then as time went even further along, it became quarterly for some people um, but the importance of a residency depends on what your idea of importance is for me it means having a home and for me having a regular gig in London at a place where I can I can feel that as a 
an entertainer, as a performer, as someone that wants to share music and communicate through music, I can make that a home. I can like, it's like, you know, when you move into a place and it's just an empty shell and then you give it a bit of your personality and do it up and maybe paint it and put the things you like in there and make it feel good and make it feel nice. And that's the way I kind of view what a residency is. And it's like, it's creating something, creating community, creating a, a space where people know they're going to come to this night and you know, they're going to hear this kind of sound and, and that they warm to that and they want to bring their friends. And for me, you know, that's, that's my vision of, of what a residency should be. Wicked. So we've heard community a lot this week. Don, let's mention it on Monday. Um, but as well, it gives you a chance, doesn't it, to kind of, you know, practice and play out to a regular crowd so you know you can you can kind of refine your craft and kind of be the best DJ you can be, doesn't it? So ideally, kind of, not everybody knows a DJ. A lot of you guys are producers. So we'll move on to some more producer-based questions. A lot of the second years are making albums, and you guys are the first years for DS20 uh, or DS21. Uh, you guys have been making albums next year. So you've made four studio albums, yeah, uh, from uh, 1998 down to 2006. Um, kind of, could you explain the process of kind of, kind of building an album, making an album, kind of from its infancy, kind of through to seeing it released? Well, there were different approaches, I think, um, to to that uh, to that question. I. I'll give you an example. I'll give you two examples. Um, the first album that I made with Leo when, when we did Low Life was uh, we uh, we made two. I don't want to call them rules, but uh, we, we you know we we made two a pact that firstly the whole album was going to be joined together, and that secondly the only rule was that it wasn't going to be house music. It was going to be anything else, you know, um, which was kind of weird as when we DJed we played a lot of house music um, but those were the boundaries that we set ourselves in the studio and the reason for doing that was because it was interesting for us it was exciting for us to not be constrained by a certain BPM to not be constrained by having to make something that we would definitely play out you know this was like where can we take our creativity where can we take the ideas that we've got and like mold them into into something else and so that's you know and, and the idea of joining it all together although not original was you know it was original for us it was like okay you know we we want to we're going to write all the tracks but we're also going to write all the joins and we're going to try and, and and turn this into a story so that was one approach was like you know what you know do you set yourself a boundary or, or do you just 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 go for it and just focus on the style of music that you're you, that you really like and you know what are your goals with it and then the other thing that I feel about um, about making an album project is is, is you know what's the story you know what is the actual story here you know what what emotions are you going through at the moment what do you want to put of yourself into this project what is it that you are feeling what is it that you're experiencing and um, although not specific to an album per se most of my most profound experiences in the studio have been when I've been in an extreme emotional state whether it's heartbreak sadness um, happiness uh, frustration um, fear of the unknown whatever it might be but I've found that I'm able to channel um, my musical creativity by expressing those feelings and uh, and by just tuning into those feelings so you know I think that that can really help to to put together the story that you are wanting to tell when you're writing an album. So you mentioned that you look for feelings, which you know is is an option. Are there any other ways or any other places you look for creativity if you kind of feeling just okay? So what do you mean, like if you just rock up in the studio and there's sort of nothing coming? Yeah, so like maybe a new piece of gear or you know like an idea or something like that. You can kind of push for people with writer's block or some kind of concept for a, for a track for an album. Sure. I mean, well, one of the processes that we used to to go through um, for a long time in the studio when I was working with Leo was I was much more the technical guy and and the engineer, the programmer, and and actually the um, you know. The, the one that was able to play stuff on the keyboards. 
Leo had a lot of the ideas and the concepts and was able to sit there and, 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 and hear things that I couldn't hear. But he would go off to secondhand record shops like the Record and Tape Exchange and spend hours and hours going through all sorts of obscure, rare or, or different albums, singles, records and come into the studio with like piles and piles of this music and we'd go through it and we'd listen and we'd, we'd see what we could find and we could, we'd, you know, we, we'd see what, you know, if, if there was anything there and if it turned us on and what we heard and, and you know, tapping into, you know, uh, you know, what's this doing to me? What, and, and, and I think that that can really help when you're a bit um, just okay and, and you're not, you know, you haven't got that inspiration to just write something. Wicked, some great advice. So one thing I noticed about kind of researching you to do this interview was, uh, especially first two albums, they're really, they're really consistent um, in sounds, but also the, the kind of, there was loads of differentiation on there in terms of like different styles of tracks. How do you kind of write something that's got different styles in, but also keeps like your sound? Well, I can't not do that. And, and you know, I've tried. I have tried to write something that doesn't sound like me, which is stupid because it, it is me um but it's it's <clears throat> it's quite difficult if you're writing music for you like i.e not a ghostwriter for someone else that's told you they want to sound like someone else to not put some of your identity into something and and you know it, you know if if you're familiar in a certain sound in a, in a certain genre or in a certain style and you go off to write something else I think that most of the time it's inevitable that some of you, some of your identity is going to seep into that. So I guess that's what happened with us. You know? yeah. how, how could producers kind of look for a sound? Do you think it's more like they're engineering or do you think it's a certain, like, like samples are used or whether they're looking for certain styles? How could do they kind of define a sound? Because that's what a lot of people kind of refer to, isn't it? Or they've got a distinct sound, that's that person. Well... <laughs> I guess in some respects it, it might seem kind of more and more challenging to do that as there's so many uh, you know pieces of music coming out every day and so so many people doing it but I I think it's that you you rip up the rule book you know you 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 do what you know you you do whatever you want to do you don't you don't feel that you're pigeonholing yourself or you're going to get pigeonholed you know just 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 experiment do things like take yourself <coughs> maybe out of your comfort zone just 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 like turn everyday objects into sounds do do things differently just just play around and just just see you know what what turns you on for me for me my rules are always really really simple two simple rules which is how does it make you feel and what does it sound like and you know if you know how does it make you feel for me is the most important thing totally great advice um so Within the albums you've written, did the record company ever encourage you to write, as you were, singles? You know, something that would sell the album as some some artists and are kind of forced. The biggest to... running joke is like after Love Story had come out and I and Billie Jean had come out, like the the head of A and R at XL would always be like, "Can you like make something that sounds like Love Story mixed with Billie Jean?" And we'd be like, uh, "No, fuck off." So Love Story, we're going to get to that. So that was like, you know, a massive, massive hit, wasn't it? And that was on off your second album, Nightworks, wasn't it, for... Well, it was actually... Um, it came out... It was written before we did that album, but it, right. it was the, the main track on the album, yeah. Yeah, and that was released on Excel, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Yeah, and you guys had Nick who did... Uh, Nick Hawks who did the interview for Don Letts on Monday. So how did kind of the signing come about with Excel for that? Amazing. I mean, it was just... Everything went kind of crazy for us for a while in that period we we had meetings with every single major record label it was sony and virgin and ministry and excel and, and then um well, everyone really and um it was it was excel were the, were the ones that we wanted to go with it was um actually funnily enough although this wasn't the deal breaker because all the record labels wanted to sign us at that point leo went to school with Richard Russell, who runs XL, and um, was really um, inspired by his vision and his innovative um, attitude. I mean, you know, right, you know, basically having the most successful independent record label in the world, you know. Um, and James Lavelle, who used to run Mowax, uh, who's part of Uncle, um, 
was desperate to sign us and he shared offices with Excel and you know he really really wanted to do it but we wanted to go with Excel because we knew that they were they were the the strongest independent and there was something about it's a little bit like Leo running the end and the end being a sort of non-corporate um super club you know it was like wanting to stay with with people with a serious creative vision and it wasn't just numbers and you know how many records have you sold although of course I'm sure they would like like us to have sold a few more but yeah wicked so um love story again was like a massive track that was 2002 um yeah. and it, it it got um kind of a vocal feature on it didn't it from kings of tomorrow yeah. and that that's kind of put it at number eight in the charts five Five. All right, sorry. How dare you? <laughs> Wikipedia's wrong. <laughs> so, um, again, like, how, how did that come about with kind of, you know, um, two mergings of a track, really? Sure. So, I um, was DJing at a Creamfields Festival in Buenos Aires, and I, had, I was DJing vinyl on three decks, and it was one of the most incredible gigs ever for us and and then I put Love Story on one deck and then I put the acapella of Kings of Tomorrow finally on the second deck and then I put like some techno beat on the the third deck and when I when I played Love Story with this beat underneath it and then put this vocal over the top I'd never seen a crowd go like that before I was like crying I'm like what just happened this is like beyond and there was like loads of like loads of my kind of legend h- heroes that had come to check check us out that night Danny Ramplin and Paul Oakenfold and all these people that had like when I was a kid I looked up to they were like god they were all there and they were like oh my god and I, you know it was a real moment so with XL they wanted a vocal for for the re- for the commercial release of the single so we went in the studio with with a couple of vocalists and got you know that they helped us to get and with different lyrics and tried all these other things and they all sounded a bit lame you know and 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 I said to them eventually I said look you have to release this version you have to release this this version with with this vocal so so that's what they did and you know you know it ha- you know it, there is something magical about that track with that vocal which you know in hindsight I would love to have um created with with a different vocal um purely because it would have got paid for it um but it would also have been nice you know if, if we'd just been able to 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 create that magic but you know what it's not always about that it's about the magic of mixing and the magic of of, of putting two two beautiful pieces of music together and creating something else you know and 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 the fact that you know that it made so many people feel uplifted and happy and joyful is priceless you know great stuff so ollie mark can we listen to a a clip of love story so this is the original mix without the vocal on please guys great track I've, I want to go and hide in a corner somewhere <laughs> super confident but as soon as the music comes on <laughs> um, so kind of bringing it around to today's market um, obviously there's loads of producers and artists out in the crowd um, do you think having so much more freedom today is is better or worse because obviously you were part of a record label big independent even though it was independent which is xl um but now people can write a track you know even master it release it and that's it do you think it's more more creative freedom now is it a good thing or a bad thing 
I've got ambivalent feelings about that. I love the fact that many, many, many people have access to technology which allows them to write music to a standard that, um, you know, that audibly is um, high quality enough to be able to, to play and to release even. Um, you know, back in back in the days, it was a lot more expensive to do that, and you needed a lot more knowledge and a lot more experience um, to be able to get to that point. Um, so I think that that's fantastic. But the fact that um, music has become so disposable, along with people's attention spans now being so much shorter i think makes it very very challenging to um give that those artists that creative freedom and but allow them to um to develop it in a way that um is uh is good for their career and and i'm not saying that that it's not but you know there's so much out there so much out there that it's a very, very, very saturated um, state of affairs. And uh, a lot of people, you've probably heard some of it this week, talk about, you know, Spotify and, and not earning any money for your music and, and music being up there. There is money to be earned if you're you're having millions and millions of, of streams and stuff. There really is. But, you know, I think it does help to have a company behind you that wants to develop you as an artist. Unfortunately, a lot of companies now want to make money from you but they don't really want to develop you as an artist so i think that's 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 a shame and it's very challenging not nobody but you know it, 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 i think it's harder now so have you got any advice for students sitting here that kind of you know obviously want to do music but how could this stand out because obviously the, the the scene's saturated or the you know the industry's saturated well you have to ignore that and you have to just keep your eye on the prize and just do it, do it, do it, do it. Don't take no for an answer. Follow your heart, follow your vision and work really, 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 really hard. And, you know, really just just keep going with it, you know. And, you know, it's, are you hungry or, or not? I mean, how hungry are you? You know, do you really, really want it? You know, if you really, really want it and you work really, really hard and you've got a vision, you can see it and you can see yourself doing it, you're passionate and, and, and you know, then you'll get there with it, you know. But it's, you can't take your eye off the prize, you know. You, you, you need to, and you need to ask yourself why as well. You know, what is your why? And that's something that I'm learning about in, in other businesses at the moment. But, you know, is it because you want to earn lots of money? Well, that's great. We all want to earn lots of money, but you know, it has to be more than that. It has to be. It has to be about your passion for the music. You can always tell when people have got passion. You can hear it in the music a lot of the time, can't you? And it comes across as an artist. So, um, great bit of advice. So, we've got a fair few techie people in the audience. What were, what were you know. using in uh, <laughs> in the nineties in terms of equipment? Just trying to remember the nineties. So that's that's a picture from the two, 2013 from your studio. So that's a little bit more recent. That was the one from Music Mag. Wow, that's that's my old studio. Yeah. Okay. So in the in the early nineties, I I got a. Uh, I've got. I can tell you exactly what I started with. I started with an Atari 520 ST computer, with a cracked copy of Cubase on a disc, which and no manual, and. Um, I learned to use it, and it's uh, like it, over a period of a couple of years. And you know, every you know, once every few months, I'd accidentally press the wrong button on the keyboard and realise that there was a shortcut to doing something that was taking me six hours, and then I could do it with one button press. So I kind of I learned the hard way, which is just kind of figure it out. Um, I bought a drum machine, a, a, yeah, um, a Roland R8 drum machine, which was which I loved, which which was amazing. I bought an old Roland TB303 for 30 quid off a friend in 1988. I, I got a, a Sequential Circuits Pro 1 analog monophonic synthesizer in a jumble sale for 25 quid, which is now worth about 1,800 quid. I, I don't even know what I did with it. I, I gave it away or something. 
and um, those were my kind of basics what I started off with. And then, and then I got uh, an, an Emu, Emacs 2 sampling keyboard. I didn't go the Akai route that everyone went, most people went back in the day. I, I went for Emu and it had a lot warmer um, filters on it. And I stuck with the, with the Emu format um, in my own recording um, environment, although the studio that I trained in was Akai and um, Kurzweil. Um, and so I was working in, in, in Mr. C's studio, a place called The Watershed. I got a job there as, a, as an assistant, like um, working 80 hours a week, making tea and wiring plugs and going to the shop for people. But I was also given studio time as part of the, the, the very minimal payment. And um, the, 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 uh, f the process in there, we were massively discouraged from sampling anything. And it was all about um creating music without samples in that studio they used the akai for drum hits and things like that but it wasn't like sampling other people's records and loops or anything like that it was write your own rhythms write your own uh, melodies write write your own harmonies bass lines all of it and so we had like a lot of analog equipment in there we had like an arp 2600 a jupiter 8 a juno 106 a jx 3p a jx 8p um we had a uh, Oberheim four voice, which was pretty amazing, and and a massive um, soundtracks and log mixing desk and um, some Dyn Audio BM fifteen speakers and, and and it was it was a great studio and I, I you know and um, yeah Roland effects units, um, Lexicon effects units, Kurzweil K two thousand. I don't know if any of these things you even know what they are, but. Um, they were kind of really difficult to program samplers that sounded really nice um, back in the day. The Kurzweil model was it was pretty incredible, but um, you needed a, de a degree in maths to be able to work out how to change a sample start point. You know, it was it was it was hard work, and um, yeah, that was that was what I kind of worked on in the nineties. So as that compared to what you're using now, you use Ableton, don't use the door. I use Logic mostly. I've got Ableton, okay. but I I I just. I've always gone back to Logic. I, I started off at, in Cubase. Then when I was at Sound Engineering College in the 90s, um, I was introduced to Logic. I had used what was Logic. Um, Pre-Logic was called Creator and Notator. Then it became Logic and now Logic Pro. And So I, I, I work in Logic. And the version 10.6 run now is much easier to use than version 8 or version 9 because I can remember using 8 or 9. It was just a headache. I don't. I don't know because I just always kind of upgraded with each version, so I never really um, sort of thought of it as easier or harder. Really, I just thought of it as new features or better sounding effects. Sure. Um, so you've remixed loads of big names: Depeche Mode, Orbital, Depeche Mode, Orbital, yeah. um, Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. Yeah. Is there anything you look for specifically when you've been commissioned to do a remix? We'll talk about the Michael Jackson uh, remix in a second. But is there anything particular you listen for when you get sent a track to, to remix? It's really... It's, it's really difficult to remix a track if you don't like it, you know. I mean, you know, the tendency might be just say yes and then you know, make it sound like you, regardless of whether you like the track or not. And that's fine to do that. But, you know, we, I mean, we, you know, we, we went for a period where we were so busy, we were turning down Kraftwerk remixes, which I look back on and think, how could I have, how could I have not remixed Kraftwerk? You know, it was, it was a crazy time because we were so busy. But I think it's, it's about what are you hearing in the track that you feel you want to do something with, you know? And, you know, it might be quite minimal. I mean, I talked to another producer um, who I look up to called Francois Kavorkian, who's made and remixed and produced everyone you've ever heard of. And he's an absolute legend. And I talk about the difference between an edit, a mashup and a remix, you know, and, and what are those differences? And we, we have differences of opinion about that. You know, he, for him, a remix could be just changing a kick drum and re-EQing a track that that still stands as a remix to him because you are remixing the track. You know, for me, a remix is take it apart and turn it into something else that that's using the the parts or the stems. You know, for me, that's that's more about what a remix is. But 
in a way, it's how long is a piece of string? You know, it's like what I, what do you want to do with it, but what what do they want you to do with it as well? And how do you find that balance between what you would like to do to it and what they would like you to do to it? Great stuff. Um, so should we take a listen to Billy Jean now? So Bushwhackers remix of Billy Jean, and we can have a little chat about how that came around. Is it a remix or an edit uh, or a mashup? I'd say it's remix. It's a yeah, remix. it's remix. great stuff guys thank you so there's a really interesting story behind this isn't there do you want the long version or the short version i don't know it's fr friday afternoon so my man says long version so <laughs> i was um i was on holiday in egypt with my son sitting by the pool and he was about six or something and 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 the original came on the radio billy jean i was just sitting there reading a book and i was listening to it i was thinking you know what when I get back to London, I'm going to go in my studio. I'm going to put a 4-4 kick drum underneath this and I'm going to loop it up and I'm going to make it a, a dance mix of this. And it will take me two hours and it will be amazing. And like, it was like, you know, right, that, I know exactly what I'm going to do. And then I got into the studio when I got home and um, you all know what quantizing is, right? So basically I hadn't taken into account that... Um, that um, Quincy Jones, although he's a great producer, cannot make a live drummer sound like a drum machine. Um, you know, so I, what I thought would be two hours of chopping up um, eight, four and eight bar loops turned into two days of, of chopping up four and eight bar loops. And I made this version, which was 12 minutes long. And the first eight minutes of it was my remix. And then the last, uh, you know, three and a half minutes of it was the original. Um, and when I finished it, I played it in in a club at the end and I've never seen a room go like that before like I was just like oh my fucking god this is like beyond I, what have I done I don't like it freaked me out and so and then I played in Ibiza um a week later Pete Tong's night at Pasha and I played it once at the end so I knew it was going to happen and I was like oh check this out and uh, same thing again. And um, there was this guy called Spoonie from the Dream Team. Spoonie was in the DJ booth. And he said, oh, I play golf with the head of Epic. Send me the dat and I'll send it to them. Like, because um, Epic was part of Sony, which was Michael Jackson's label. So I'm like, okay, amazing. I got back to London, I've called my lawyer um, and said, look, I've made this remix. It's too big for me to like put it out. I need to do it legally through the legal channels what do we do? So, you know, he, he said to me, you know, you know, you, you send it to, you've sent it to the label and, and all this. So I sent this dat to this address that I'd been given. And I got a phone call from somebody a few weeks later in this record company saying, hey, we, th this thing's arrived on our desk, but we've got no idea who it's supposed to be for. And I said, oh, right, okay, well, I, I'll follow it up. Tried to get hold of Spoonie, who'd given me the address. Couldn't get hold of him. Next day, I walked into a record shop to go record shopping. And the guy behind the counter said, oh, we got your new record in. And I'm like, what new record? And there was like 200 copies of a record on the counter, and it was Billie Jean. And someone had bootlegged it, right? And I'm like, I haven't released any records. Where did you get that? And they wouldn't tell me where they got it from. And so I... I so I, I got wrote to Sony and, and you know I went to and fro with this and it, then it, it went crazy it was like it was in in New York in the record shops there in LA in the record shops there it was in HMV in, in Piccadilly Circus they were selling like thousands of copies of it a week at 10 quid you know and it was like they did many 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 copies of this record Sony wrote back to me and said we're not going to sue you because we're aware that you tried to do this through the right channels so we won't take any further action and to this day no one's actually owned that they put it out so I didn't make any money lots of people love the record somebody made lots of money 
And here I am. I reckon it was Spoony. <laughs> his, his address was round to his mum's, nice mum's, mum's, mum's house. That was it. <laughs> that straight to vinyl, sorted. Wicked. So that was a massive, massive release for you, wasn't it? And is it something you do quite often, like uh, test your tracks out in a club to see what the reaction is? Yeah, it is. And, and you know, interestingly, that's what I found difficult about creating music during COVID, or at least creating um, dance tracks, because there was nowhere to test the music out. And I found it really hard to be inspired during that period in the studio. Um, you know, I, some people, you know, managed to get their heads down and write loads and loads of music. I, I actually found it really challenging because I couldn't, you know, there was, there was no club to be in to, to A, hear other music in a club and B, test my own music in a club. But yeah, I, I find that that can be really helpful. And, you know, if, you, if you're lucky enough to, um, or in a position to be able to go and test drive your music, then you can come back and tweak it. But, you know, just on that note, I mean, you know, another th great thing to do, which a lot of you will be aware of, is to listen to whatever you've done on loads of different types of systems, whether it's a car stereo, whether it's like, um, you know, telephone, headphones, um, you know, whatever, but just to see if anything's sticking out or if you can't hear anything or if it sounds shit in mono, you know. It's really important to do that because it will help you to get some kind of representation of whether it's going to work in a club or not. And a lot of clubs, even though they're supposed to be... Um, amazing sound systems do end up with a lot of mono coming out of their systems. So it's, it's good to remember that. So you've DJed all over the world. Um, your touring schedule is picking up again, but, you know, before it was hectic, wasn't it? You know, how many, how many gigs would you be doing a, a weekend or a week? You mentioned with your residences, but you, that's not including flying all over the world. And Yeah, I mean, there was... Um, there was a, a time when we were really, really busy where we kind of knew what gigs we were doing uh, for, you know, we could, our diary was full for a year, year and a half in advance. And so it would be two or three a weekend and then maybe a few extras. It wasn't as crazy as perhaps the Jamie Joneses and, um, you know, um, kind of Adam Bayers uh, 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 of, of the last 10 years have had it because there's been, uh, you know, the, the industry has grown exponentially. There's been a lot more gigs in a lot more countries, a lot more, a lot more territories have opened up to that music in the last 10 years. And so there's been more to do, you know. But um, for us, you know, you know, three, four, three, four a week was a lot. What's your favourite city to play in apart from London? Because I know you'd probably say that. Oh, city's difficult. I mean, I couldn't name you one. I've had great experiences in Tokyo, Sao Paulo, Buenos Aires, um, you know, um, New York. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's just, I like the city vibe. I like the way that, that there's a heartbeat of a city and a, and a tempo of a city. I, I love that. Great stuff. Um, so recently you've set up a new business, haven't you, which was part of the lecture before. Um, but ideally, as like an artist, whether that's performing or DJing, it's really important to look after yourself, isn't it? It's really important to look after yourself. And, you know, I I do feel privileged and blessed to be able to sit up here and, and even have this conversation and, and very grateful to have been asked. But, you know, it could have easily been um, a case of I'm not even here to do this anymore if I hadn't made certain lifestyle changes in the last... You know, I'll, I'll say ten years, but you know, I you know, I started trying to make those changes probably in about two thousand and six, and it took quite a while. But yeah, it is important to look after yourself. Um, you know, at the same time as you know, if you really want to get there and be successful, and you're passionate and hungry for it, you're you're going to work really, really hard. And sometimes you won't even think of work as work. You just think I'm just doing this because this is what I love, and I love what I do. But it's important to take some little little breaks. It's important to take some time out. And, and it's also really important to know if you've got a niggle that you're being excessive in some way, whether it's alcohol, drugs, whether it's other addictions, um, you know, or introverted and isolated and cutting yourself off from other people, um, you know, don't ignore it. Talk to someone about it. Make it... Um, you know, make it, I don't want to say common knowledge, but share, don't keep it to yourself because a lot of the people that end up in, you know, very dire situations 
um, haven't haven't told anyone what's really going on, you know. So, how hard was it at kind of the peak of your career to pull yourself away from a party? It was, you know, it, it was... I was doing gigs. I started um, doing things without um, without drink or, 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 you know, the things that I was doing in my kind of teens and 20s. Um, you know, I started doing that, like I said, in sort of the, the mid-2000s. And I had various degrees of success with that, various periods of time where I'd just be go abstinent of, of any drink or anything else. And, you know, I was still getting so much from it, from the music, from the buzz. Because when you're giving yourself as a performer and you're giving yourself, you know, uh, you're communicating through music to the crowd and it's going well and, and you're in sync. And, you know, that that is the best feeling in the world. You don't need any of those other things. But at the same time, the challenges with that, staying up all night, um, waking up in a hotel room after two hours sleep and having to go to the airport and fly somewhere else and then getting there and someone going, you know, let's go to the after party or come with us or stay longer and, you know, relentless every week. And when the party's that good and all those people, they love you for those those minutes and hours and they, they, they want you to be with them and... It's like it's it can be challenging to to say no, you know. Um, so I did, I struggled with it at times. I struggled with it when I was very very tired, not so much on the night of the gigs, but the day after when I'd had very little sleep and I was on my own, alone, bored, a bit lonely, you know, hungry. No, those uh, knowing that there was still something going on in someone else's room in the hotel or or somewhere else and. So it, it was challenging, but you know now nowadays I, I'm very very, you know, adamant that that just taking care of myself, getting enough sleep, eating good food, um, connecting with nature, connecting with with good people is all part of of my, you know, staying in a good place. Do you think that's a key to sustaining like longevity in your career? Then looking after your spouse, especially as a touring artist or a DJ. I do, and you know, do I have regrets? Honestly, in yeah, in some ways I do because I feel that although I was having a great time in those, you know, in those years and partying, at times there were lots of other times where it wasn't that great. There were lots of other times where I was just searching for for that extra high or searching for that thing that. I experienced when I first went out and just was always trying to repeat the same experience and you know the, you know I, I if in hindsight I wish that I'd been more level-headed and you know kept my feet on the ground a bit more instead of being up in the clouds but nevertheless saying all of that those experiences for me personally are why I'm able to you know run listen up therapy and be a psychotherapist and work with people who know that I've got an understanding of what they might be going through and and so I'm not um, recommending that lifestyle as, as um, a pathway to a future career but I am saying that you know by having made those positive changes um, I am able to to share that experience with people. So it does seem to be uh, a little bit of culture to kind of party hard and not want to go home, especially for the younger people who are coming into the industry and people can easily get caught up in it, can't they? But what kind of advice or one piece of advice would you give yourself or your 20-year-old self if you could look back on your, your career and kind of just tap on the shoulder and say? Yeah, it's if, if you feel like... <laughs> There's something niggling you, you know. If you like, I, 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 I'll, I'll share my experience. Even, you know, I started partying. Like when I say partying, I mean going to raves and taking ecstasy and doing all the things that everyone was doing in 1988. But like, I knew within a year that something wasn't right. I knew at the end of every weekend that something wasn't quite right, and that I needed to, at some level, that perhaps I needed to like have a look at this and 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 I didn't you know and so it, it's like listen to yourself and and you know like just think about you know how is it affecting your moods and you know you know how is this affecting your your relationships your interactions and and you know it can be uh, look partying's fun and it's supposed to be fun but excess is is going to take you further away from where you want to get to in your careers and in your lives it will it will it's you know, it, what goes up must come down and, and it's really important to remember that. 
Yeah, it's very true. I mean, I've seen DJs that have, you know, totally gone off the rails, but also some DJs, it seems to be a trend now that people are just sober. People like Steve Aoki, uh, Anna as well, she's a techno DJ that doesn't drink or do anything, or she's super positive. Even the tour managers, all she's about is a career and music, and that's it. Do you see what I mean? So it's a really positive thing that people are kind of changing the perceptions, really. But has he stopped throwing cake at people? <laughs> I don't know, maybe. <laughs> so... um even though you've kind of, the, this COVID happens, yeah, so, as, as we all know, um, but ideally you, your tour dates have started to pick up. Um, so can we just have a look at the tour dates pick, just to see what you've got coming up, to give the guys a little bit of a schedule. And this is kind of, you know, not super busy, is it? I wouldn't want to be any more busy than that, <laughs> I don't think. So you can see what we've got, Glastonbury Festival, two days. Any spare tickets? <laughs> Pikes of Ether. Um, again, Pikes of Ether. Is there anything you're particularly looking forward to? Uh, I'm actually looking forward to Manchester tomorrow night. I mean, it's it's really about you know connecting with people, connecting with music, and just just feeling that energy. You know, so it's like there, there are lo loads of things on there that I'm looking forward to. But you know, I, I just feel really grateful that I've got you know gigs again, and that I'm able to go and connect with people musically because you know it's it's great sitting up here and talking and and, and um, sharing, um, but for me, the power of music is is just so it's next level, you know. Great stuff. Shall we have a look at you in action? Um, you playing the Zoo Project in Ibiza? So, Ollie, Mark, can you play a clip of that, please? So that's Zoo Project in Ibiza, if nobody's been. It's a pretty good event. People dressed up as uh, animals, all kinds of things. Yeah, daytime parties, outdoors, it's just the best. Definitely. So um, we're moving on to kind of the, the mental well-being and mental health uh, kind of part of the talk, uh, which you did touch upon in your last um, kind of lecture. But there's only a few people there, um, some here again, but we're going to go over some stuff that's a little bit more broad. Um, so what could be some of the signs that somebody may be suffering with depression introverted um you know when, when people struggle to get up and to find any motivation to do anything that can be a sign of depression um it, depression is 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 an interesting one and it's often you know it's it's, it's, quite, it's kind of an invisible illness in a way because Many, many people will have absolutely no idea if you're going through that, including you, you know. Um, it can take a while for you to realise that, you know, that, that that's what's happening. But, you know, lack of motivation, you know, no desire to even get out of bed, you know, and, 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 and you know, finding it very, very hard to, to feel connected, you know. And, um, oh, I can think of... I have suffered uh, with depression several times in my life and um, sometimes without realising that I was and, and other times, you know, in full realisation, it's very, very difficult to snap out of that. It can last weeks, months, even longer. Um, and there are different levels of depression. There's mild depression, there's chronic depression, you know. Um, are you having, you know, uh, things to watch out for um, a little bit um, with yourselves as well as are you having thoughts, you know. Are you, you know, are you having thoughts about, you know, ending anything, and you know, there are again, there are different levels of that. Which I, I don't want to, you know, sound morbid, but you know, need to be um, mentioned. You know, there's a difference between feeling a bit crappy or feeling like shit and thinking, oh god, I've had enough. I wish I wasn't here anymore. That's not, um, you know, as severe as as it might feel in that moment. What is severe is if you start making plans. You know, and you're thinking. I'm going to end it and I'm going to figure out how to do it. And, you know, I think 
when somebody around you can't see what you're going through, it's important to speak up, you know, because a lot of people can't see it. A lot of people can't see it. I've been, I've been deeply depressed and been around people that have said, you look so happy, you seem so happy, it's great to see you, you're on great form, I can see that everything's amazing and I'm kind of sitting there thinking, you know what, I've, I'm going to cry, you know, and, and so it, it is invisible, it is invisible for a lot of people um, but there are plenty of things that can be can be done with depression, you know, it, but if, if you are suffering, it is important to try and talk to people about it. And if you feel like you haven't got anyone to talk to about it, like you, you can't approach your family or you're struggling with friends, there are helplines you can call as well. There are people you can call or, you know, you can talk to your, you know, I, I don't know whether it will be your teachers that might be able to signpost you, but there are numbers that you can call as well. The Samaritans, for example. Great. So the, the first stop for you guys, if you are struggling with anything depression-wise or any other kind of mental health issue, is, is safeguarding, speaking to a tutor, obviously, and then being signed, posted to safeguarding. Um, but kind of people struggle with anxiety as well and kind of and, and depression. How, how, what positive changes can people make to get out of that or kind of break the cycle, as it were, as, as, an, as an artist working in the industry? I think it's important to talk to other artists as well and to, to, again, to share what you're going through. I mean, I do recommend people talk to somebody professionally if they are, if they have the capacity to do that. And one thing that uh, there's a, you know, a stigma attached to therapy, which is that, you know, a lot of people don't look for or seek or enter into therapy until they've, you know, hit rock bottom or a crisis occurs and it doesn't need to be like that at all you know you you know the 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 positive work that you can do on yourself by talking to somebody professional before it hits crisis level is is remarkable and can you know can make profound changes in your life saying that I'm not sure if I've got off piece with the question, but saying that not everyone can afford therapy and not everyone has access to low cost or free therapy. And a lot of universities and institutions have long waiting lists. And then when you get there and the NHS, when you get there, you only get a couple of sessions. So that can be challenging too. But a lot of um, services that do offer therapy have low cost therapy. And, and if they don't, can signpost you to places that do. So... In terms of, as an artist, I mean, we work with loads of people in the creative industries. That's kind of why we started the company, for people that have anxiety and depression. I think it's important to talk to each other about it, to share, again, share what you're feeling. And, and, and you know, if you do need to talk to someone professional, then, you know, go and look for it. Great advice. Um, so... We're coming towards the end of the interview. Has anybody got any questions? We'll open up to in a second. Uh, Kev will come around with a mic. Uh, but just for you, what, what's kind of next? You focused on the DJing. Obviously, you've got um, the uh, Listen Up um, business that you've just set up with Belinda. Um, what, what's kind of coming through with you? Well, the next stage for us with, with Listen Up Therapy really is because we've already got my private practice is busy and we've already got another couple of um, psychotherapists, one who, who specialises in working with, with students and young people. Um, they're pretty busy. Uh, the next stage for us with that is, is the mentoring uh, work that Belinda's doing with people, which is it's not therapy per se, but it is specifically working with um people that might be struggling with with creativity or social um, anxiety or, or depression or, or, or you know various um, presenting issues but the mentoring is coming from a slightly different approach which she'd be happy to talk to you about so we are going to be focusing on on that the other thing that I'm working on and that we're doing together is I'm working on a, a massive project um, creating functional music for wellness which is um, a combination of, of my own musical productions um, specifically designed to create either re relaxing or recharging or um, creative um, enhancement. And I'm using a combination of binaural beats, specific frequencies and tempos and um, positive affirmations and mantras. And I'm starting to work in immersive audio to create this immersive experience that's kind of based on music, science and spiritual principles to help people to, um, with their cognitive awareness and, and with creative blocks and, and, and to help recharge. So that's a, a really big project that we're working on at the moment. So keeping yourself busy? 
as well as touring, making making any new music apart from the, you know, club music or anything. Done a few remixes. Got a um, collaboration with Archie Hamilton that's taking me forever to finish, and a collaboration with Carl Cox that's taking even longer. <laughs> oh, nice, great stuff. So, what we're going to do now is open up to questions. Anybody got any questions? Just wait for Kev to come over to the microphone. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, how do you sort of put yourself into the mindset before a gig, right? So you've got Glastonbury up there as well. You've got a hell of a lot of gigs as well. So uh, especially being sober too, you've not got that, you know, adrenaline of, you know, the alcohol going through you. So how do you sort of um, mentally prepare yourself? How do you get yourself in that zone before? Do you have like a routine? Do you meditate before? What's your, what's your sort of routine with that? Um, First and foremost, the music. So I will make a confession uh, that at this point in my life, I rarely listen to the music that I play until quite close to a gig. So, for example, um, I haven't really listened to that much of the kind of music that I play in the last three months because I haven't, I haven't done very many gigs. But on the day of the gig, I will go and connect with the music. And then when I connect with the music, when I'm listening to or selecting some stuff for my playlist and my headphones... I get so excited about it that I start to feel like oh, I'm actually really buzzed up about this now. Um, my my daily routine is pretty healthy these days. So in terms of in terms of mindset, you know, it's like I manage my expectations of of uh, what the gig might be like in terms of like, well, okay, I'm 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 not going to be hanging around afterwards for that long. I'm aware of that, or you know, I'm I'll have a plan for kind of like what I'm doing beforehand or what I'm doing afterwards, and you know, it, it, one thing that, that this isn't completely related to what exactly you're asking me to, but one thing uh, that I found has really helped in terms of staying in a good mindset is not feeling guilty about going home or about not getting there until just a short while before I play. There's, there's often a peer pressure to stay longer or to get there early or, you know, I don't need to be in that environment as a sober person for longer than I, I choose um, than I choose to be. So that helps me with my mindset as well, you know. Um, it is challenging sometimes, though. It can be, you know, it de just depends on the environment. If the technical setup's good and the, the people managing the stage are, are doing a good job and, and you know, hospitality is, is under control, then it's great. But if you've got some, like, coked-up lunatic that won't take you back to your car because he's freaking out and he's got all his clothes on the back seat and he doesn't want you to squash his, like, shirt that he's just ironed and so he drops you in the middle of nowhere, that's not cool. Is that from experience? Absolutely. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> Thank you. So add at the back. Hi, yeah. Um, are there any DJ decks you can recommend? Pardon? DJ decks. DJ decks. DJ decks. That I, that I recommend? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm not sure. I mean... I, I'm still, I'm old school. I've still got the same set of Technics 1200s that I bought for my 18th birthday at home. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of still stuck in that kind of old school vibe. Cool, nice one. Thanks, Ed. Uh, I think we had another question down here, Kev. I was uh, wondering if you had any tips on how to like, Go from being in local clubs to like build yourself up and branch out further and further, because obviously like there's a lot of DJs. How do you get people to actually notice you're different? Brand, create your brand. Like you're a DJ. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can be a local DJ for everyone else, or you can be a local DJ and then create your own brand as a local DJ, and then you know get your little crew of, of DJs DJing with you. I mean, Fuse. Fuse is a great example. Solid Grooves is a great example. Abode is a great example. You know, they started off small. They started off as small, local DJs. But it's about your brand as well. So it can't just be about whatever your name is. It's about what your brand is. And then, you know, you, you can grow that and then start to take it a little bit further. And I, I think that that can be really powerful, you know. Cheers. Great. So, any more questions? Another one back over here, Kev, please. Hiya. 
Uh, yeah, so if you were to put yourself back into like um, back into your sort of 21 self um, and try and put yourself into now, um, so you're 21, I'm t- currently 21 now um, as well, in s- more or less similar position, um, trying to make music and get it out there. There's a lot more things that you've got to think about when being a musician. You've got to be a social media manager, you've got to be a graphic designer, you've got to be this and you've got to be that. How much time do you think that you would have personally spent, like, say, per week on, like, music business stuff and sort of categorising your time like that? Because obviously you can't just spend all your time making music and making, making music because you've got to spend, yeah. But how, how would you how would you categorise your time with that if you would be young and um, uh, sort of up and coming now? Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. And, and, you know, there are a lot more considerations that weren't around um, before, particularly around marketing yourself in, in social media and, and and that side of things. I, uh, for me, working with, with Leo was um, interesting because our roles were so different. Um, I'm not saying you have to work with a partner, but I'll give you an example. I did spend all my time making music and DJing and performing, but I was also the programmer the musician, the player, the creator, and the performer. Leo, with, with his business sense and his management, and um, you know his dealing with agents and 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 promoters and managers and travel arrangements and all of that stuff. You know, I you know he dealt with all of that. So when we stopped working together, I was like, you know, what you mean? I've actually got to talk to all these people as well as making music and so it can be very challenging but you know um (laughs) you know i I, i'll bounce it back to you how do you think you should do it how do you think you should manage your time smartly smartly (laughs) um yeah it's yeah like you say about sort of building a team really getting people that can do you know the jobs that you don't want to do better than you can do in them anyway and then you can spend the time that you know you enjoy on what you're good at like with the music stuff, doing that. Yeah, yeah t- that. time management is really important. Mm. Yeah, if you if, if you can structure your time, but I think one of the most important things about that as well is that you don't want to take your foot off the off the gas. But when you do structure your time, leave some gaps in between things as well, because if you structure your time with no gaps, you will burn out. Yeah, yeah. No, actually, no. It's the exact same thing. Thank you. That's really helpful. Ricky, great stuff. Any more questions? Any more for any more? Uh, Mark, was there any online in the chat? Okay, wicked. If we've got no more questions, thank you very much, Matthew. Massive round of applause for Matthew. That's a bushwhacker. Wicked, thanks, guys. Everybody's free to go, and I'll see you around. <laughs>